Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Reich, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and to the 12th event of our monthly webinar series, Climate Conversations, Pathways to Action. The National Academies provide independent objective advice to inform policy with evidence, spark progress and innovation, and confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. In keeping with this mission, we're excited to host these conversations about issues relevant to national policy action on climate change. I'd like to acknowledge that the National Academy's Washington, D.C. headquarters is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nequantitank and Piscataway peoples past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have been its stewards throughout the generations. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land and acknowledge that the expertise held by different Native communities is crucial to the work of understanding and addressing climate change. Our conversation today will be recorded and available to view on this web page immediately after the event. If you'd like to ask questions, please submit them in the box below the video at any time, and we'll incorporate them in a dedicated question and answer period in the final 20 minutes. We also invite you to participate in the polls that will appear in that same location and to give your feedback after the event in the survey linked above the video. Above, you'll also find a link to register for our April 21 climate conversation about how to respond to the rising seas that already threaten people, infrastructure, and property on U.S. coastlines. If you want to be notified about other upcoming climate-related activities at the academies, you can sign up for our newsletter, which is also linked above. Today, though, we're going to talk about opportunities and challenges related to expanding one form of infrastructure, electric vehicle infrastructure, in U.S. states. I'm so pleased to be joined by Katie Fehrenbacher, a journalist who's covered climate tech and electric mobility for over 15 years. Katie will introduce our conversationalists and moderate the event. Thank you again for joining the National Academies for Climate Conversations. Katie, it's all yours. Thanks, Alec. I appreciate it. Um, hi, so glad to be here. I'm Katie Fehrenbacher. I'm a journalist um, covering climate tech and clean mobility. Um, and I'm pretty ex very excited to speak with our panelists today. You know, after years of playing a niche and marginal role in our transportation systems, electric vehicles are finally having a breakthrough moment. Um, in 2021, close to 9% of car sales worldwide were electric, compared to 2.5% in 2019. You know, some regions of the world are leading on these efforts, like Norway is the example everyone always gives, where close to 90% of new car sales are either electric or plug-in hybrid uh, cars. In America, California, not surprising, uh, is the far and away EV leader. In 2021, 12.4% of vehicles sold uh, in California were electric, and the state has now passed 1 million electric vehicle sales. So many factors will play a role in how fast or slow these EV sales numbers in the US and globally will grow. You know, but one major factor is how easily drivers of EVs will be able to charge up the batteries that power these vehicles. You know, the vast majority of um, electric car charging uh, will be done at home with relatively slow overnight residential chargers, but the EV market needs many more chargers installed uh, at places like shopping centers, coffee shops, um, uh, uh, or uh, along um, uh, highways and corridors, um, you know, so that consumers can have these kind of driving uh, on the fly places to plug in. Um, the Biden administration, through the bipartisan infrastructure deal, plans to invest $7.5 billion and help states build out a network of 500,000 EV chargers across the U.S. It's the largest investment in, in EV charging by the feds in U.S. history. Um, but, you know, as private and public funding moves into place, there's many issues that need to be worked out, like standards, interoperability, maintenance customer facing software and apps, all these good things. And so my experts today are going to be talking about some of these issues as this money kind of pours in, you know, you know, what's going to happen to this space. Um, I, I'm going to introduce uh, Gil Tall. He's the director of the Electric Vehicle Research Center at the University of California, Davis. He is currently leading research on local planning and deployment of electric vehicle infrastructure, GIS tools for infrastructure planning and the secondary market of plug-in vehicles in California. And we also have Melissa Savage. She's the director of the Center for Environmental Excellence at the American Association of State Transportation and Highway Officials. She oversees center programs and products promotes the center as a resource for state transportation agencies and works with state departments of transportation to identify priority policy areas. 
Um, and I'd like to um, tell the audience that um, we'd love to hear your questions. Um, this is your conversation too. So please submit your questions via the comment box uh, below the video. But let's let's start this conversation. Um, so can we start off by talking a little bit about your backgrounds and how you came to this space of um, digging into EV charging infrastructure? Gil, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I I'm studying transportation for more than 20 years. Uh, from the behavioral and planning uh, side. So how people are uh, driving or using transit and why and when and so on. And 12 years ago, when electric cars started to come back, it was clear that the behavioral side is missing. Uh, there were a lot of uh, electrical engineers that were doing it, but not so many people uh, that look at uh, the consumers, what kind of cars they want, how they will drive it, how they will charge it. So that was a, a great opportunity for us and I joined this uh, center, the Electric Vehicle Research Center here at UC Davis 12 years ago. Uh, and now I'm the director of the center. So everything I will say today is coming from a vast research of many of my colleagues, but it's all my opinion. And <laughs> I take my respons full responsibility on that. The nice thing of <laughs> being from the academia is that we can say everything we want. <laughs> Love it. All right, Melissa, what about you? Tell us a little about yourself and, and how you came to this world. Sure. So I've spent the bulk of my career working for state-based membership associations, but always on transportation, energy, and environment issues. So I started working at the National Conference of State Legislatures, and I was there for about 13 years, again, working on transportation, energy, and environment. Before coming to ASHA, I was at the National Association of State Energy Officials, um, and that was, uh, I left NASIO about five and a half years ago. And so that was really when we saw a lot of work around the Volkswagen settlement happening. Uh, so I was at NASIO um, when that was just getting up and going. And when I came to Ashto then, um, certainly, as you know from my, my bio, I do a lot on environmental issues. Um, and electrification is definitely something that we've seen quite a bit more state DOTs interested in. Um, and I'm excited to get into this conversation. Thanks, Melissa. So just to give the audience a little bit of kind of the basics and, and to get into this conversation, you know, why is EV charging, you know, important? Let's start, you know, why is expanding this, um, this network of EV charging important from a, you know, a climate perspective and an environmental perspective? Gail, let's start with you. <laughs> um, so I think that we all know that we need to do it because transportation is kind of the number one green greenhouse gas uh, uh, source. And we, need to change it. There will be people say, oh, but our electricity is not very clean and so on, but it's a long, long process. We have 200 million plus car, 250 million cars and light duty trucks on the road, and we cannot replace them all in one day. I, I like to say that electric car is the only car that you can buy today, and it will be even cleaner 10 years from now on the road, because the grid that you will use, the, the electricity that you will use 10 years will be even cleaner than today. Yeah. So it's a, a climate change issue, but also an air quality issue of switching over transportation to electric vehicles. Gotcha. And, and how are consumers um, going to be mainly charging these vehicles? You know, I kind of said in my intro that, you know, the vast majority of charging is going to happen at home, but there's different types of charging that, um, you know, are, need to be built out. Um, can Melissa, can you run through kind of a variety of like how people will be charging and, and what, where we need this, um, where we need to build out chargers. Yeah, sure. So as you as you mentioned, you know, largely where folks are charging right now is at, at their home. Um, but when we talk about being able to do a cross country trip in your electric vehicle, one of the things that we need to make sure is that there is that infrastructure available for folks traveling down the interstate. Um, and so, you know, I think that that, and I know we'll get into this a little bit later, but the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act or the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, they, there's a program in that bill that's going to really help um, build out that infrastructure. So you can, you'll be able to travel across the country without having um, range anxiety. Um, in the space, there are spacing requirements. And so I think that's um, definitely a piece of it. And then of course, there's a need to make sure that um, we're getting the right amount of charging in the right locations in the rural areas and um, disadvantaged communities as well. So I think we see that in the bill also. 
Um, but th that I think is is one of the the important things about the bill and and what they're striving towards is getting this um, nationwide infrastructure in place. Yeah, um, let's talk a little bit about that. The act, um, you know, how big of a deal is this seven point five billion dollars for EV charging? Is it is it enough money? Is it you know is it more than enough? Um, can you help the audience think about some in context, like how far does that money go? Gil, what do you think? Uh, is it enough? It's a very good start. It's not, it's not enough to kind of finish the transition to uh, elect, ele electric transportation. Uh, and it's not even most of the money that we'll see invested in uh, electric transportation. The state, uh, the uh, car companies, energy companies, uh, and other you know, utilities, there will be much more than the seven and a half billion dollars from the federal government, but that's the seed. So it's a very important starting point. Kind of connecting it to your previous question in a, in a funny way, all of this money will go to these chargers that are less used. Because as we said, most people will charge at home, will charge at work, but uh, it's much harder to uh, come up with a business plan today with their initial investment for the freeways. And that's what the first focus is on, on the federal bill. Yeah, I know um, a big chunk of the money is going down to states, to um, state DOTs to implement some of these plans. Melissa, you know, are state departments uh, uh, ready to make all this happen with the EV charging infrastructure? Yeah, so I would, I would say that, um, you know, many states have been working on electrification for the last 10 years, let's say. Um, there are several regional um, groups that are working together. Um, the West Coast Electric Highway, which I'm sure Gil is familiar with and Katie as well. Those are good examples of states that are really um, start kind of leading the way. Um, there is uh, also some opportunities for state DOTs to tap into some of the federal funding um, and reimburse, be reimbursed for planning activities that they're doing right now, which I think is important. Um, capacity wise, um, you know, we're already seeing states that maybe were, are newer to um, the electrification, looking at staffing um, and getting the right, the right folks in, in the door um, or exploring other kinds of models. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about those later. But I, I think that um, many of the state DOTs that have been active in this area also know and recognize that there are partnerships that need to be formed um, for success, for this program to be successful. And, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I uh, used to work at the National Association of State Energy Officials, and I would, I just want to point out one partnership um, that we're really proud of over the last couple of weeks. We signed an MOU between AASHTO, um, NASIO, and uh, the Joint Office, the DOT and DOE Joint Office. And that, that MOU is really um, designed to kind of formalize our partnership and making sure that the state DOTs have access to the right technical assistance at the right time. And so, you know, I would also plug their uh, website, uh, driveelectric.gov. Um, I think so far it's it's pretty new, but but uh, our members are, are being able to access um, the technical assistance through that way. And it's so far so good. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, for the first years, there were a lot of the uh, investment and the planning were going to the environmental offices, energy offices, and transportation. Uh, so the expertise are out there, but not always in the right place. Right. So the first thing need to be done is kind of to shuffle the, the right people and to bring the right expertise and to help each other, which is kind of happening all over the U.S. right now. There is one pet peeve that I always like to, to drop in because there are very few of us that were in this business for a decade and more. Uh, we always like to talk about best practices, uh, but, uh, and, and that's very important. That's a way to learn, but there is a great opportunity to all also learn from the worst practices, for things that never worked, for things that failed. We have tried it. And I can see not a lot, but every once in a while now in, the, in this wave, things that failed uh, on the previous wave. And, and if people remember, during the Obama administration, we, we had the, the uh, first serious wave of federal money to install chargers. And it would be nice to go back there and see what, what works and what didn't work and, and how and, and why. Yeah. And maybe I will stop it here. But it's, it's a, it, not just best practices, also worst practices are worth learning. 
Yeah, that's a great segue into we want to move into talking a little bit deeper, take a deeper dive into how this all relates to policy and planning now that we have a little bit of our bearings about, you know, what the act is, how charging infrastructure works and all that good stuff. Um, Gil, I'm going to come back to you because, you know, do you have any thoughts right now about kind of looking back on, you know, how the, the original wave of federal funding for EV charging came out? Do you have a few best, you know, looking at some of the worst practices? Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on you know, what would be better to do this time around? Um, <laughs> I think that uh, probably the most important issue that we are tackling today is how to make sure that we are not just investing in hardware, but in a reliable and dependable infrastructure that will serve us 10 and 15 years down the road. Uh, and usually the government is pretty good in paying someone to build a new bridge, put a new charger, but we are less, we, we don't have always the right practice, the, the right tools to make sure that it will be there 10 or 15 years down the road, operatable, connected to the power and, and so on. I think that's part of it is thinking about new ownership uh, 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 um, options uh, and think about new agreements uh, and not just count the number of charges because that will be kind of short thing like just counting number of charges. So, and yeah, yeah that, that's I think the main missing part or the main lesson from for me from 10 years ago, many of the charges that were installed back then are not in use today, 10 years later. Mm. And I know a lot of um, EV owners um, kind of complain about going to a charger and, you know, a few of them inev inevitably aren't working or they're, you know, not connected to the internet or something, some kind of problem that seems like maintenance is a pretty significant issue um, in the industry right now. Melissa, if states want their funding to go towards, um, you know, building new stations rather than operating the stations after they're built, like what's the business model for operating charging stations? You know, are states in active conversations with, you know, potential partners around that? Sure. Yeah, and I think the, the main focus right now for the state DOTs is building their plans, putting, putting pen to paper, um, those will be due August 1st. Um, between now and August 1st, we expect another um, round of guidance will come from Federal Highways around May 13th timeframe, which will include standards uh, and, and those kinds of requirements, which I think gets at this um, you know, question that, that we, AFSHTO, had when we responded to uh, the RFI that Federal Highway issued um, at the end of last year. And that this idea about future proofing, um, first of all, and you know, I think as Gil just mentioned, I mean, some of the chargers that were around 10 years ago aren't, aren't working we're around now. So technology is, is hard to um, predict well, where we'll be, but you know, the states wanna make sure that they're building assets in a way that can be as future-proofed as possible. Um, and to get to your question about maintenance and operations, I think that is um, one of the things that we, they are exploring, of course, is what kinds of partnerships can they leverage to make sure that, you know, they have the right um, private sector partner or the right utility partner, um, helping them make sure that those are going to be maintained and operated well into the future. And I think the other piece of that is going to be site host um, when they when they start figuring out where they're going to place this infrastructure, um, who, which kinds of hosts, you know, you talk about restaurants or private, you know, uh, strip malls, those kinds of things, um, you know, th those conversations are, are definitely happening. How do we make sure this um, investment, uh, either through the state level or just the, the EV charging investment, um, can help make... Um, access to EVs and EV charging more equitable since these aren't particularly going, you know, for residential um, communities, you know, so, you know, how, how does that play a role um, kind of equity and access in all of this? What do you think, Gil? Um, okay. Let, let me just kind of, because we, we opened a door for a, for a kind of a, a bigger question and I just want to close it fast. Sure. Uh, when we talk about the future uh, proofing and so on, um, I, I like to say that we are very certain about the technology these days. We don't expect any major changes in the next 10 or 15 years. We're not expecting uh, any, you know, people are coming with um, hydrogen or battery swap or cold fusion or any other of these things. 
uh, charging while on the road, while driving. All of these technologies are somewhere out there and maybe 20 years from now, but what we will invest today is 100% sure will be used 10 and 15% years down, down the road. So that that's not the issue today. I think we, that's the nice thing about electric cars. We already know that we have good solutions. We are in the in the mass market phase, not in the experimental phase. And, and if someone comes and say, oh, let's wait, you can wait, but that's the cars that will be out there 10 years from now and they will use these chargers and even 15 years uh, from, from, from now. Uh, the, the problems are the business models uh, and responsibilities and, 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 and making sure that there will be the right owner, will, it will be worth for them to fix this charger and make sure it's operatable 15 years from now down, down or 10 years down the road. Just kind of closing this door because I hear a lot of people who are waiting for some miracle. Miracle will come, but that's not instead of electric car. And equity, equity is a big one, uh, especially because most of the Americans are not buying new cars. We are buying used cars. Uh, my cars are 17 years old and six years old. Uh, and, and many of us are waiting for these used cars and need a, a simple and cheap uh, way to charge them. Uh, but what we invest in today, this long freeways uh, is something that everyone is doing with new or used cars. And for the time we, we make it, we need to see good infrastructure out there to make it uh, not just reliable. I like to use the word dependable network, something we can depend on when we're traveling. Mm -hmm. So making it reliable, reliable and dependable, I think will make it more equitable for, for people to access. Uh, absolutely. We do need to invest more for people who cannot do it themselves because everyone will benefit from it, but the, the initial investment is high. Uh, and it's about rural areas, it's about apartments, it, it's about uh, a, a communities that have high, exp high exposure to emissions, to local emissions. It's all need to be part of the equation. Yeah. And from my just personal perspective, I've been wanting to buy an EV for 15 years now and 10, 10 years from now, 10 years um, now. And, uh, you know, it just doesn't make sense unless there's some kind of, you know, public charging um, that I can tap into. So I've definitely been waiting for, for something like that. So excited to see kind of what this holds and how this can kind of bring us into the market. Um, Melissa, let's talk a little bit more about kind of the state uh, perspective, you know, how, you know, you're talking about different states thinking about EV, EV infrastructure in different ways. Can you talk about kind of this urban and rural areas, how they're approaching, you know, EV charging and the build out of stations differently? Yeah, sure. So I think one of the things that's important to point out is that the, the funding um, that was in the bill, the formula funding, the $5 billion, uh, the priority for that, for those dollars will be the, the alternative fuel corridors. Um, and these are designated corridors um, that exist, um, but there are some gaps. So the, the initial priority is going to be building those out. Once a state has built out their alt fuel corridors, um, then they can start looking at other, other roads and places that need um, additional infrastructure. So that I think that's an important distinction to make about the $5 billion. Um, but I also know that you know, Justice 40, um, which is a new, um, uh, new with the Biden administration in terms of 40% of the benefits need to go to disadvantaged communities. How does that, how does that look? Um, and certainly rural, the rural piece of it is, is a component that, that needs to be considered. Um, I know that that, um, you know, as Gil mentioned earlier, kind of the urban areas, maybe where air quality isn't, isn't great, um, you know, those are benefits that we need to be able to, to leverage um, and make sure that the infrastructure is at multi-unit dwellings and that we find a way to make sure that there's equity when we're placing them in rural areas. Um, and so, you know, I think the states um, are considering that as they're putting their plans together, there's a requirement in the um, the plan that they that they address that and and I know that they're all very they're taking it all very very seriously. Yeah, Gil, what do you think about this corridor approach? Do you think that's the most efficient way? This is the right way to do it. 
um it it's one of them <laughs> it's not i i i'm not sure it, it's uh, okay so le- let's go back to your uh, comment that uh, you need a public charger in order to uh, to buy a electric electric car and i think that we talk about two different stories uh, and we need to make sure that we know that we're talking about two different stories story number one is our routine behavior what we do on every regular day go to work drive back shopping and so on We did a, a big study who actually dropped their electric cars. Not many. Most people really like them and buy. The people who drop electric cars are the people who haven't had good overnight charging while they're at home. Uh, and, and that was a very, very clear. If you don't have a, a, a reliable overnight slow charging, uh, it's really hard to own an electric car. And even this nice corridor will not help you because that's not your routine. The one we are talking about mostly today, these corridors, is a very different story. We hardly use it. Some of us are not using it at all. It's an extension of our cars. It's like my uh, all-wheel drive. It's nice. One day I will go to the snow. It's an extension. These chargers on the way to the East Coast from the West Coast are extension of my car, and it's really important to have them there. I think it's very, if you ask if it's a, it's a smart way to start with that, it is because Uh, it's the one that needs public money for sure. There, will, there is no business case today until there will be enough car there that will be willing to pay. Uh, and it's really, really need this public money. And then we will buy these cars because the chargers are there. Mm-hmm. Okay. In terms of the you know, business and private sector moving in, you know, what are some of the key ways that businesses have played a role so far in expanding EV infrastructure? You know, the automakers I know are building some, like Tesla has their own. There's these um, EV charging companies, Chargepoint and EVgo. Um, you know, kind of what are you guys seeing in terms of like, successful private uh, business models? Let's go to you, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think, you know, we're definitely, and I know our members are um, hearing a lot from uh, private sector right now, um, especially with the, the tried and, and true and trusted partners that some of our states have already been working with. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, one thing we haven't talked about yet is, um, you know, these dollars are tied to Buy America requirements. Um, and so one, um, one thing that our members are definitely looking into is, is there a private sector company out there right now today that would be compliant with Buy America requirements and be able to produce The, at the volume that we're looking at. So I think that's one kind of question that's out there. But we also know that um, p- public policy can be a triggering um, event. And certainly we, we have also heard that there are companies that are moving operations um, and manufacturing um, to the United States. So I think that that's, that's good. But in, in terms of getting back to your, your first question, which was, you know, what are the models? What, are, what, are they, what do they look like? I think One of the nice things about the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act is the way it's structured is that it encourages um, those kinds of partnerships. So there are opportunities for state DOTs and those are encouraged. Um, we, we, we see it in the 90 day guidance that came out in February and we certainly hear it from both the joint office, uh, well, all three, the joint office, DOT and DOE, that these, are, um, these partnerships are going to be necessary. Um, and so I think When you talk about what models exist, I mean, that just making sure that we're partnering with the right folks um, to, to be able to, to not only build it out, but also maintain and operate it as we talked a little bit earlier about. Thanks. Um, oh, I'm just gonna remind the audience that um, if you have questions for our panelists, please put them in the comment box. Um, we're gonna turn to those in about 10 minutes. Um, and we want to go and uh, turn to a section to look at kind of the next steps in the future of what's, you know, where do we go from here? Gil, did you have a comment before I kind of ask? One I, I, I will just want to throw in a few more uh, examples on uh, on these private public partnerships or of some kinds. I, I'm just saying it's very early days and every day we learn about new way to do it. And you mentioned Tesla and Tesla, it's a great uh, example of you buy a car, but you already, the Infrastructure is part of what you paid for, uh, but all the main car companies, all the main OEMs sign contracts with the providers. 
so when you will buy your next car, you will get some benefit in, in, in this charging that we're going to see on, on the roads. Another great, very recent example, I think that Volvo and Starbucks are going to install fast chargers. So if Starbucks is your coffee, you will have the fast charger very easy for you to find. Uh, and, uh, and many other examples, uh, Shell is investing a lot in, in chargers. So gas stations that kind of move to, to chargers. And I think that every other day I learn about new business models or new opportunities that are coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exciting. Gil, how do you expect consumer behavior to change when EV ownership extends beyond just the early adopters? Is it going to look similar, just more, or are folks going to be starting to interact in different ways with these vehicles? So about 12 years ago, we had a, a very big study with electric cars out here. People were getting them for a full year. It was actually the BMW Mini E, the first one. And there, was, there were zero public chargers back then. The only option they had is was to charge at home or to find some neighbor's plug or friend's plug and do it there. They were very happy with their cars, very happy. They, they When BMW were coming to take them back, they were fighting to keep them. Uh, and the reason is most of them had additional vehicles, not most, all of them had additional vehicles in the household. So if this is the, if the car haven't had enough range or was not big enough, that was not an issue. They were taking another. That's what we're going to see with the early adopters on all 50 states for, for, a, for a while. Before we will start to move into this early majority here in California, we're already there, that rely only on their, their electric cars. And they will need much more reliable and dependable network. They will need chargers that they can trust 24 seven. In rural areas, people will buy trucks, this nice F-150 and Rivians, they will, they want to take this truck both for the daily routine and for the weekend adventure, and they will have to rely on it. So we, it's, a, it's a slow shift. We don't need all the chargers to be there tomorrow. We can sell millions of cars with the infrastructure we have today, but eventually we will need to move to a, a enough infrastructure to be reliable and dependable. Just throwing in something without getting too much into it, we will never build enough infrastructure not to have congestion on holiday eve or you know peak time that's same as roads but we need to have enough that we will not have a a, a, a totally breakdown of the system we don't want a gridlock yeah i know i see on twitter all the time lines of tesla uh, owners at superchargers kind of chomping at the bit and ceasing elon musk on their tweets asking for more chargers so i know it's a problem in, in certain areas when uh, wealthy folks with teslas uh, Melissa, as EVs become more prevalent, there'll be less revenue from gas tax. How to address this? Um, you know, will the mileage-based user fees or other approaches? What, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think, you know, even from my days at the National Conference of State Legislatures, I say um, mileage-based user fee, via, uh, vehicle miles traveled tax, um, all had been discussed. I mean, and this was, you know, 15 years ago. So we were already needing to think of a different way to fund our roads. Um, you know, fuel economy standards were, were impacting the gas tax collection. Um, so now as we move into uh, electric vehicles and we see more and more of those, um, you know, I think there are pilots out there um, and there have been for a long time, mileage-based user fees, you, you raised that. Um, and then we also know that there are, several state DO, or state legislatures out there that have passed kind of these um, back of the envelope calculations in terms of what an electric vehicle would pay in gas tax if it, if it, uh, if it was paying gas tax. Um, and certainly that's one way of doing it. Um, you know, I, I think the conversation is one that, that needs to be had. Um, and I, I, uh, I know we, we talk a lot about it here at AASHTO um, and we we hope that we'll, we'll kind of resolve that um, as more and more um, EVs come on the road. And, you know, as we, we talked about this new this infrastructure, um, you know, it's a deposit, it's a down payment for sure, as, as Gil was saying. But if, if the end goal is to increase EVs on the road, then that's a conversation that will need to be had. 
I'm going to stay with you, Melissa. You know, what, what are the most urgent public policies or levers we need to push um, to, uh, to hit this goal of maximizing, maximizing vehicle electrification and reducing emissions? Well, I would say, you know, certainly we've talked about EVs are important. Transportation is, is a large contributor to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We know that. Um, we also know that there are other, um, you know, there, that it's part of the, the solution and there are many other parts that we need to look at as well. So, um, you know, certainly this bill that we've been talking about um, today uh, is transformative um, and there are many other areas within the bill that also will enable um, states, uh, DOTs and other agencies to explore other opportunities to get at that um, carbon reduction. There's a new formula program on carbon reduction. There's a new formula program on resilience. So this, this bill, I think, is really um, a, a push in that direction. I think you also see many states have their own um, goals, and they've set you know, reduction goals for their state. And those policies are also significant levers for sure. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're definitely heading in the right direction in terms of policy that um, now on the books, federal level, and definitely within the states kind of pulling those two together. Um, so we're, we're definitely, I mean, you know, we, I can't, I guess can't overstate this again, I'm going to say it again. Um, it's a down, it's a down payment, it's a deposit. And we're heading in the right direction, but there are there are lots of other um, things that need to be addressed. So, um, but I this is a transformative bill for sure. Yeah, um, I think I want to um, end before we go to the audience questions to talk a little bit about um, kind of this vision when um, electric vehicles are a lot more prevalent. They, they you know. 30, 40, 50% of the vehicles on the road are electric. You know, what kind of opportunities does that unlock for this kind of uh, future of like vehicles can plug into the grid and utilities can use smart software to make these kind of bi-directional charging and use it to make the grid more resilient? You know, what does this ideal picture look like and how far away are we from that? Gil, can you talk about this kind of V2, yeah. V2G vision? <laughs> V2G vision, or let's start with half of the cars on the road. Uh, President Biden wants half of the sales to be electric in 10 years from now, or less than 10 years from now, which means that half of the cars will take 15, maybe more, 15 to 20 years from now. We will have half, to, half of the cars on the road will have uh, a plug uh, if everything goes by, by the plan. And, and this is great because that's what's happening globally, and we don't want anyone to stay behind. We want everyone to have this opportunity. And if, if uh, what's happening right now is this bill that we are talking about, that's a, open the door for everyone to be part of this transition. Uh, and and we, we are doing it. Uh, so uh, in, in the future, and that will take time, we, we will have much cleaner electrical grid and much more cheap electrical grid and the electric cars will be part of it it's not going to be a cost it's actually going to be an asset you can connect your car to the grid first you don't need to charge it immediately when you plug it in it can be charged when you have cheaper electricity or cleaner electricity second actually you can feed back you can feed back to your house in, in if you need you can feed back to your uh, to your grid if if needed it's going to take time we need the batteries, we call them the, the million miles batteries. We need batteries that will hold much longer than the cars. And we are getting there. These new technologies, new chemistries are coming. We need this infrastructure that can go both, both ways. And we need a, a, a critical mass. With one car here and one there is, no, is not enough. But as you said, when half of the cars will be on the road, electric cars will be part of our solution to have a cleaner, reliable electrical grid. Yeah. Well, we have a ton of audience questions. I'm going to try to get to as many as I can. Um, uh, this, your comments, Gil, leads me to kind of highlight one. You know, what changes to the current electricity system um, uh, will be needed as demand increases? Gil, let's have it. Why don't you take a stab at that one since you were just talking so, a bit about yeah. that? <laughs> we can have millions of cars without doing any change. That, that's kind of the starting point. We, we have a capacity 
in many places it's because the heavy industry disappear and because uh, we are we have much more efficient lights and we are getting more efficient in general so having more cars to start with need nothing later <laughs> when we get to the 30 40 50 percent we will need to generate a little bit more electricity we will need to upgrade our infrastructure all the way to the distribution if a small cul-de-sac have three four five tesla likes or f-150 likes cars uh, that will have more demand overnight and we will need to slowly uh, update uh, the, the grid that we are doing it anyway um, it's happened fast and slow at the same time we need to do it but it's not going to break the system it's not that fast <laughs> yeah um another couple more technical questions you know um is there a movement toward one standardized type of charging plug that all vehicles can use in the future um it seems like there's kind of a few different standards out there and it's a little bit um you know confusing and arduous for for customers to kind of figure out this kind of whole landscape uh, thoughts on standards either gil or melissa I just want to say, you know, I'm going to the gas station, there are three, four nozzles there, and that's okay. So first, it's not such a big issue to have three or four nozzles connected to the same charger or the same uh, uh, gas pump. So we should not make it as, uh, too big. We are not installing anymore a charger that would work just for one or the other. But I already see kind of a natural shift. Some are winners, some are losers to a, a more standardized uh, way, but all of the new investment will be open to all of the uh, all of the cars, and that's the important part. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Melissa. Oh no, I, I was going to do that. That's right. Okay, kind of. What about this whole issue of cybersecurity threats around the electrical grid and EVs? Is there a way to kind of future proof or invest in how um, to make sure that you know our EV infrastructure isn't you know able to be uh, uh, taken over or um, taken offline or things like that. Um, what do you think, Melissa? Well, um, yeah, I think that's a concern. Um, and it is a requirement in the state plans that they're putting together right now is to look at cybersecurity. Um, and that is one area that we, um, you know, we talked earlier about best practices and lessons learned. Um, you know, one of the, the things that we've been doing with uh, the National Association of State Energy Officials is working to put a clearinghouse together where we have this kind of standards and, and best practices and those kinds of documents is for only state only um, access, but to get at that data sharing and, um, you know, what, what uh, the standards need to be um, so that we can ensure cybersecurity, um, uh, you know, as much as possible around this infrastructure. I think it's, it's really important and um, definitely top of mind for our members. Um, and, you know, we'll, we're, you know, future proofing cybersecurity could be, be a stretch, but we, it's, it's part of the plan, they're part of their plans and they are absolutely interested in, in working towards it. Okay. Sounds good. And um, uh, another audience member is wondering about any kind of tools or guidance or resources for um, for states that are developing EV charging plans. Um, is they given the limited guidance from the FHAA, you know, where should they turn to help kind of build those types of plans? I'm sure you guys have a bunch of those. Yeah. Um, so driveelectric.gov, that's the joint office. Um, they have uh, technical assistance. They have a state plan template. Um, they're they're willing to do one on one conversations with the states. Um, they have a lot of proactive. They have proactive technical assistance, so there are information on their website, and then reactive as well. States can reach out to them to have one on one conversations about issues that they may be facing. Um, so, I would I would first say go to driveelectric.gov, um, and then you know also just be reassured that the associations, ASHTO and NASIO, and we've also been working with some of the utility-based membership associations as well. Those, those partnerships, partnerships are gonna be very important as the state DOTs start writing their plans. And um, one thing that um, an audience member is interested in is, um, you know, we haven't talked a lot about commercial vehicles or trucks, buses, um, things like that. And, and this plan specifically, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think is for 
kind of charging for vehicles, electric cars, right? Um, so kind of, is there a separate one for commercial side? Um, you know, what do you see in the cards for, for um, boosting the amount of electric commercial trucks and buses out there? Uh, this one is for light duty vehicles uh, and the money out there is for light duty uh, vehicles and light duty vehicles. We already have millions of them on the road and that's kind of the, the one that is already on the uh, a quick move to main, uh, 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 mainstream main, main consumers with, uh, with heavy duty. It's moving so fast that it's amazing. It's much faster than what's happened with light duty and we will need, much more investment in infrastructure, but it's a very different type of infrastructure. Uh, mostly it will be depot charging. So every car will have at least one, what the same as overnight for light duty, that will be the depot charging for heavy duty. Uh, and it's a very different story if we are talking about delivery truck, if we are talking this uh, Amazon and FedEx and uh, that are around our streets versus the 18 wheelers that will go uh, uh, long uh, trips. Just uh, I think very important to kind of say that the heavy duty is what going to give us most of the benefit on local emissions. If we want to clean the diesel from our neighborhoods and from our homes, that's about electrifying the heavy duty. It's, it's uh, for, for many reasons, it's as important if not more important than the light duty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, would, I would just add there that, uh, you know, that is a consideration for the state DOTs, certainly, when we first uh, started digging into the bill and recognizing that the focus for sure is light duty, um, our members are, are thinking about medium and heavy duty um, charging for sure. And so while this pocket of money is dedicated for light duty, I think, um, you know, that is a consideration. And I think the states are, are looking for how to, how to, how to help. How to, how to get that infrastructure built out as well. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, we talked about kind of best practices, lessons learned from the um, kind of original wave of funding in the Obama administration, but what about from other uh, countries, you know, China, uh, Norway, uh, you know, countries that are building out EV chargers uh, more quickly than we are. What are some lessons learned from international build outs? What do you think, Gil? Um, we are keep looking at the international build outs and, and see what works and what's not. The lessons are, are very similar to ours uh, about getting a reliable and dependable. Uh, you, here we are talking about 50 miles and Europe are talking about, uh, I think, something similar, 70, 80 kilometers between fast chargers on, on, on the freeways. Uh, we have the big advantage of uh, the fact that most of the cars in the U.S., not most of the people, most of the car in, in the U.S. are living in uh, detached houses with garages. So uh, we are one of these countries that most people can plug in their cars without any investment. Uh, in Europe, in other places, in China, most people live in apartments, in multi-unit dwelling, and uh, they will need much more public infrastructure to put it together. Um, this uh, interoperability topic is something that we can learn quite a lot from the Europeans. They're moving very fast with combining all of them. What we would like to have is that you won't need 12 different apps on your phone and, and six different subscriptions to, uh, to charge your car. Uh, I have one ATM card and I don't really care which ATM it is. Maybe I will have to pay a little bit more if I'm not a member, but I can use all of the charges all the time. That's something that we really need to, uh, to, to learn from, from Europe and, and from China and, and from others. Yeah. And this question about um, uh, EV charging in apartments and for rentals, you know, are there particular considerations um, or incentives that uh, to get charging stations at apartments or similar living arrangements? You know, what you know, are there things in this bill or are there things that should have been in this bill or are there, you know, other pockets of money out there that can help kind of solve this difficult issue in the U.S.? Well, um, there, there is discretionary grant money in this bill that is available. And I think when we talk about accessing um, the pots of money, you know, once a state is able to show that their corridor, their alt fuel corridor is built out, in a way that they had planned according to the, the law, then, you know, I know that that's definitely um, an area that they would, you know, that they would like to pursue because that's, that's 
an, a pro, that's a, a challenge that needs to be overcome in terms of um, apartment buildings um, and, and as Gil mentioned, places where you don't have a garage where you can park your car and charge overnight. So that is top of mind. And I think, you know, the other thing I would say is that as the states are building these plans out, they are absolutely taking consideration other plans that they already, that may already exist within their state. And sometimes they have plans that relate to, um, you know, this kind of charging infrastructure in urban areas. So I think, you know, that's one, one thing to consider is that this is a program. It is part of larger solutions in many states. Um, and so, you know, that that is something that that they're striving towards also. Any other thoughts, Gil, on that? California, for example, already invests quite a lot of money in MUDs uh, and disadvantaged communities and put these chargers there uh, from state funds, from uh, the utilities uh, and others. So it's, as, as we started with, the federal money is probably... I don't have the right number, but I will guess that it's probably about 20% of the investment we see right now in charging infrastructure. It's just a guess. I may be, I may be wrong, but I, I, I know for sure that it's less than half. But my guess is it's about 20% of the total funds that are going into infrastructure right now. Uh, and MUDs and so on is really important part of it, and a lot of it is coming. The gap that I see that you were talking about that I, I'm not seeing enough, I think, work on it right now is renters. Uh, if you rent a detached house, even if you have a garage and everything, it's much harder for you to upgrade your electrical uh, system and to put a charger or solar panels and so on. And we probably need to help more uh, on that. Uh, low income that have nice detached houses that are not just living in MUDs uh, need help. So um, I think that we, um, as the government, really like to go for the public infrastructure, but the government can also help and subsidize the home charging as part of this transition. Mm -hmm. What about gas stations? Uh, will gas, do you think gas stations will play a meaningful role in uh, this EV charging infrastructure landscape? Yeah, Gil talked about Shell. You know, they're making some investment there. Um, and we also, um, you know, hear from truck stop operators also, um, you know, some of the requirements around spacing and siting of these of this particular infrastructure is every 50 miles within one mile of the inter interstate. Um, so gas stations, that's, you know, they're there. So um I would imagine that there will be that will be part of it, but also to Gil's point, um, you know that some of some are making the investments um, already and and have already considered how to how to fold electrification into their their business model. Yeah, I mean, Gil, yeah, you can follow up, but do 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 uh, gas stations need kind of a new kind of a new landscape? Do they need new amenities and services? Like, do, do you see that emerging as a, a space that you know? that private equity or someone's going to come in and kind of build these new gas stations? I, th I think that when uh, when we're moving to kind of larger scale, we, there will be a, a benefit for an economy of scale, 10, 20, 40, 80 charging stalls at the same location. Uh, and, and this way you can actually balance the, the power between the different cars. You have more reliable system. If one or two is uh, offline, uh, you have less queuing issue. Uh, so these big chargers may happen in gas stations, but not all gas stations will be a right fit for it. Uh, malls, we just talked about Starbucks, um, and, and uh, some of the gas stations will become uh, charging locations. They already have the benefit of having the convenience store uh, and, and uh, restrooms and everything, and that's an important thing. And the most important thing is that um, when you design where to put the gas stations, you make it as easy as as possible for the driver to get there. We see a lot, not a lot, we see some freeway uh, fast chargers that were installed, for example, on the rest stops. And when you put it on the rest stop many times in order to get to it from the other direction, you need to drive to the nearest exit to do a U-turn and to come back a couple of miles. Uh, in most cases, gas stations, when they, they were designed, they were already in the place that you can get to them from both sides and also from the local communities. Uh, so they do have the advantage on, on that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, my, okay. My last question, um, before we hear a little bit about your takeaways from this conversation, um, you know, what do you, are there any technology innovations that you've seen that you're particularly excited about in the EV charging and infrastructure landscape, you know, whether it's software that can manage the charging or, you know, I know people have been talking about the battery swapping again, um, you know, talk about a failure that happened before is this coming back, you know, from a technology perspective, is there anything you're particularly excited about um, around EV charging infrastructure? Bill probably has more. Uh, <laughs> um, technology. I, I think that what we see is faster and faster charging. Uh, and that's something I, I really like to see. Uh, and we move from 400 volt, 450 to 800 to 1200. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, we, we look at back compatibility. So not everyone will need a, a charger in two minutes and will want to pay for it a, a lot of money. And I think in the future, when, when our market will, will grow, we will have people who say, oh, I prefer to pay 40% less because once a year that I need this fast charger, I will wait for 20 minutes. Versus someone who said, oh, I will pay this extra and charge in two minutes every time I'm stopping at, 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 at the charger. And this thing is growing and you see more of these options, uh, more batteries that can take faster charger, bigger batteries, faster charging opportunities, but, but not only as replacement of the existing one, but as in addition to an existing one. So we, we're going for the all gamut in, in the future. That's, I think, the most exciting uh, op opportunity. Uh, battery swap, uh, uh, hydrogen, they, they will all come, but that's kind of far. That, that's in order to push it to 100%. But I think that for the first 50, we have the technology. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Gil. Um, just a final question for you guys. You know, What's one thing that you'd like our audience to take away from today's conversation? We covered a lot. We covered the, the build, infrastructure, kind of the build out, how everything works. You know, what's kind of the most important like, takeaway would you like our audience to, to keep in mind? This is a lot, the, the toughest question for last. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess, if, you know, coming from a policy perspective, I think I, I would just say that, you know, the bill is, is um, it's talked about it being transformative and we kind of talked about some of the other beyond the electric vehicle part of it. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, one thing is that it's going to be more, this is a part for sure um, of getting at um, or talking about climate change. This is part of it, but there are other parts in the bill. Okay. What do you think, Gil? Final thought? I, I, I really like what Melissa said. So I will go with the final thought to, uh, to the EV owners and said, uh, you don't need to wait for this bill to install of this charger to enjoy electric cars. You can buy and drive them all over the US uh, today. And if, uh, and if you drive quite a lot with today's gas prices, that makes tons of sense to, to go and do it. And with this infrastructure coming, it will be even more easy to more people and more type of cars and uh, and these things is happening it's not a theory anymore it's happening and it's happening big time great all right thank you so much Gil and Melissa I'm going to turn it back over to Alex to to take us out thank you so much for your thoughts thank you thanks Katie and thank you for your fantastic moderation and thanks Melissa and Gil for your reflections and your time and your leadership in this important and very very fast-moving area um, thanks to all of you at home or work for joining the National Academies for our 12th climate conversation and for asking so many good questions. I'm really glad we were able to get to so many of them. So kudos, Katie. Um, today's conversation was recorded and will be available for viewing on this same web page immediately. Um, next month on April 21st, we invite you to join us for our next climate conversation, which will be about how to respond to the rising seas that are already threatening people, property, and infrastructure including roads and electrical infrastructure on U.S. coastlines. The link to register is above the video. In the meantime, you can sign up for the Climate at the National Academies newsletter to get notified about all of our upcoming climate events. And as a final reminder, to share your feedback on today's event or your ideas for future events, please see the survey link above or in the announcement below. It's just a few questions, and we really appreciate hearing from you. Lastly, thank you to the Climate Communications team at the National Academies and to everyone behind the scenes who supported today's event. We're excited to continue the conversation through future events like this. Stay safe and have a good one.